Good evening. I'd like to start by thanking Frank for inviting me back to speak and also tell you how much I appreciate everyone's patience in allowing me the year to heal since the first time I tried to deliver this on the battleship. <laughs> we'll try and get a little further in the presentation this time. Tonight's topic, of course, is African Americans in the Union Navy, which is a very little known aspect of the Civil War. Most of what we know about the African American contribution in the war, of course, comes from the U.S. Colored Troops. This is a much studied topic that's been most recently and rather well showcased by the movie Glory. Now, certainly the 54th Mass is not the only USCT regiment. There are 179,000 soldiers of African descent that make up 10% of the Army in the North. You can uh, probably tell me more than I know about this fellow. Their experience is separate and definitely not equal. This is a first step, but it's not all good news. Their pay is often delayed. When they do get their pay, it's lower pay than white privates will get at the time. Um, they're actually charged for their clothing on top of, of everything else. They get inferior medical care, inferior equipment, and they serve in segregated units under white officers. There's no racial mixing in USCT regiments. We can forgive history buffs for assuming that this experience extends to the Navy, that service afloat was very much like service ashore. It is not in the least, and it is entirely up to this fellow, Gideon Wells, Secretary of the Navy, who, along with Secretary of War Stanton, formed Lincoln's team of Neptune and Mars, as he called them. Wells is a staunch abolitionist from Connecticut, but to understand what he does during the war as far as treating all races in the, the fleet equally, we need to go back to the beginnings of the Navy. During the Revolutionary War, there are thousands of black sailors in various navies. I say various navies because there's not only the Continental Navy, which we would call a federal organization, each state has a navy, and of course there are scores and scores of privateers. Uh, a lot of blacks served in all three of those. The problem was that at the end of the war, we decided the navy was too expensive to maintain, so the Continental Navy is disbanded, as are all the interracially mixed crews at the time. However, by 1798, Jefferson realizes we need a navy again, and he commissions six frigates to be built along the eastern seaboard for what we think is going to be a shooting war with France. It doesn't come to that. It's just a quasi-war, and the navy is integrated because after this war scare, if you will, times get good again. There's an economic boom, so a lot of white sailors leave the fleet to go serve in the merchant marine or serve ashore, so that by the verge of the War of 1812, 10% of the U.S. fleet is African American again. By the time the war actually begins, 50% of Oliver Hazard's Perry crew are black sailors, including 360 black Marines, which you never hear about. Perry considered that these men fought like tigers, which is a direct quote. This quote I didn't expect to see at this time, and again, this is one man's opinion. Uh, bear in mind throughout this presentation that there is rampant racism, sadly but we're going to examine the Navy point of view on all this. Surgeon Parsons considered that there was no prejudice shown on the Java among different races. This attitude extended up the line too. Chauncey said basically that it doesn't matter how you're dressed, what color you are. That's no indicator of qualifications. Joshua Barney, I'm being asked by President Madison if his black sailors would run at the first shot fired by the British. He said no, they don't know how to run, they'll die at their guns and his men fought that landed battle to the death. By 1815, with the end of the war, the U.S. Army banned blacks from serving in the military, in the Army. The Navy does not. Technically, this is illegal, but the Navy needs men is the bottom line. Not too many years after that, one American officer quipped that there was no finer collection of Huns, Goths, Chinamen, and blacks in the United States Navy. This is because the white sailors didn't want to serve in the Navy at the time. Nonetheless, the Panic of 1837, which again made a downturn, meant that white Americans suddenly wanted to be in the Navy again. And so they set a quota of 5% for non-whites in the fleet. Now why is it that guys don't want to serve in the Navy? If you're a true-born son of the Republic, you don't want to serve in the Navy if you can avoid it. Some of the books that we subject our children to, and we probably suffered also as great literature, were actually hot topic exposés at the time. Both Dana's Two Years Before the Mast and a couple decades later, Melville's White Jacket were exposés of service ashore, uh, service afloat. This was said to be the closest a white man could come to experiencing slavery. Bear in mind that your captain has the power of life and death over you. There was one instance where the son of the Secretary of the Navy was hung by his captain because the captain considered he had done something worthy of being hung. Uh, this happened all the time. And 
if you are, again, a freeborn white male in the North especially, why would you subject yourself to this if there's other economic opportunities? However, for African Americans, especially in the North, because they were forbidden from doing this in the South, this offers a steady job. You might, the husband might be away for a couple months, he might be away for a year, but allows him to establish a family unit ashore that he can then support when he comes back again. It's a rough job, but it's a steady job. But that one line about no dogs or sailors allowed, that was actually posted in seaside restaurants in New England. Nobody wanted to see sailors come ashore. On the eve of the war, that 5% quota is only half filled. The Navy is only 2.5% African American at this time. This is critical for Wells because it allows him room for expansion. At the start of the war, of course, the Navy is desperate for men. We actually have gunboats that we have built, begged, borrowed, or, or captured, but they're sitting idle for lack of crews. The problem is he can't get white sailors. Only Army enlistments count towards the quotas set by the federal government. If you join the Navy, it doesn't count. So the state wants to usher you into some of its volunteer regiments to go be federalized and serve with the armies of the North. Similarly, they're not paying bounties for sailors. If a sailor joins, he gets no bounty from his town, his city, his state, or the government. He just joins. Soldiers are very attracted by a couple hundred bucks in their pocket. Also, blacks at this point are barred from serving in the Army. That means they're available to serve in the fleet if they want to. Wells immediately enlists 900 black sailors. By 1862, in February, the Liberator, which is an abolitionist newspaper in Boston, has a beautiful quote that should be better known. The Navy has not been in the habit of examining a seaman's complexion before shipping him. Can you fight is the only question. Oddly enough, when the Navy recruits, you look at the muster rolls and the rendezvous lists, only rarely will they put down what we would consider a racial indicator. They're more interested in scars. The reason they're interested in scars is if this fellow deserts and I know he's got a cutlass scar here and another cut here and I catch him and he says, I'm not him, we'll match him up with those scars and haul him back for a court martial or to duty. They're more interested in that sort of thing than they are your race. The closest you come is they'll say, darker light. Well, that could apply to any race on the planet. That's as far as the Navy goes. Now, how can the Navy get away with this? This is the same period that Union generals are being slapped down for jumping the gun and recruiting black soldiers everywhere we're fighting. For one thing, the Navy is not a state Navy. Remember the militias that are sent from New Jersey and Massachusetts, New York, et cetera, et cetera? Those are federalized state militias. They are loaned to the federal government and owned by their own governors of their states. So they're a state organization that has to be recruited in public, drill in public, and get sent off in the public eye. Sailors serve in a federal institution. The states have no say in who gets recruited in the Navy. What's more, when you go to a naval rendezvous, literally a get-together, and you're recruited by Navy officers, you are whisked away to what's called a receiving ship. This is a dismasted old ship of the line, a uh, picture old Ironsides with all her masts lopped off and roofed over. Uh, they're called guanos because that's where the pigeons tended to nest and you can do the math. You would stay there out of the public eye until you were tasked to go to a certain squadron. So nobody knows who's on board those ships. There are two distinct groups of uh, blacks that serve, northern freemen and southern contrabands. The Navy is very surprised by the sheer volume of escaped slaves in the South that want to join the fleet to find the Lincoln gunboats. In the North, 63% of the volunteer black sailors already had maritime experience, either in fishing fleets or in other navies. Uh, we recruit a lot of people internationally or the Merchant Marine. They receive a rank based on their ability, no matter their skin color. In the South, and this was an assumption on the Navy's part, but it's been proven by uh, data, the National Park Service analyzed a lot of data on this. They were believed to have a lot less experience, which they did. A lot of them are field hands, farm workers, things like that. The South had totally restricted the use of African Americans in any sort of sailing occupation because it offered a chance to escape. They couldn't even be exposed to the maritime world because in the years before the war, when a federal ship, or a federal warship, pulls into a southern port and the men would go ashore on liberty, black sailors were incarcerated in a local jail until the ship was ready to leave, then they were ushered back to the ship. That way they couldn't talk to other local African Americans who might decide life at sea is better than slavery. Those fellows were supposed to be, from the South, uh, enlisted at the very lowest rank. That is in the Navy, a boy. That's not a slur, that's a rank. You have first, second, and third class boys, and it goes up from there. Now, Wells knows what the letter of the law is, but he's, he's willing to bend the rules. All the contrabands were technically enlisted as boys. That way there's, you know, nobody up north gets upset about that. But by the time they get to their ships, 68% are rated above a boy as a landsman. This is the next highest Navy rank. I think it's something of a slam against people that join the Navy and don't know anything about the sea. 
their landsmen. The ship captains promoted locally. Wells doesn't have to know about this, so he has plausible deniability, and he's just as happy to get experienced people into the ranks. In March of 1862, surprisingly, we have our first all-black Navy crew. You've all heard of Monitor and Merrimack, correct? And Monitor was the solution to the problem. At the time, nobody was certain of that. For one thing, Monitor is one of three radically different ironclad designs that the Navy was scrambling to get completed. Monitor gets completed literally on the, 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 the crews down there. Plan B was a submarine that was built here in Philadelphia, the Alligator. Plan C, believe it or not, were ram ships. This idea is cooked up by Stanton when he, he realizes that the Monitor is so tiny and it's going up against this monster Merrimack, which is what they usually called it. And when these volunteer ships get down to Fortress Monroe, the crews have not been told what their job is really going to be. There are four or five of them. The idea is to encircle the, the Merrimack, which goes very, very slowly, and ram her. It's a bad day if you get a broadside, but the guys coming from other directions will probably ram her and push her under with her low decks, the low freeboard. It's not really a bad plan, but it's antiquated. No one tells the white crews that they're not just going to run supplies. They get down there, and the local Commodore Goldsboro gets up and says, my brave boys, thank you for volunteering. We're going to go sink that ship. And to a man, everyone goes like this. They basically desert. They're not going to sign up for this. Their officers are mortified. Uh, they're without a crew. They go back to New York for a second crew. The very night they're going to recruit them, the first crew goes to the same bar as the second crew. Bang, there goes the second crew again. No white guy wants to serve on board one of these ships, the Arago. Down at Fortress Monroe, the captain goes to General Wool and says, I need 50 strong men just to do the grunt work on board the ship. Can you give me 50 soldiers? And Wool says, I need 1,000. I can't give you 50. But if you want to recruit from among the stevedores, the escaped blacks who have now earned their freedom and are working for the Navy and the Army to unload and offload ships, uh, and load ships, he approaches a group of 350 of them. He gives a speech that sounds like it's straight out of a bad Hollywood B movie, but when he finishes, 350 feet tromp forward, followed by 350 other feet. They all volunteer because it's just the labor that even white sailors would do on board a ship, raising the anchor, hauling coal, things like that. They pick the 50 biggest guys. Those guys enlist in the Navy and serve in the Navy throughout the war. We don't know about them because, one, this was done totally on the sly. The Secretary of the Navy sent down his assistant every now and then just to check and see how the crew was doing. And you know, from our perspective, obviously, they did just fine. But this was the first time that the Navy had had a totally African-American crew. And they wanted to make sure things were working out. They worked out just wonderfully. But because we never actually had to ram Merrimack, we don't hear about this at all in the history books. So how were these men treated? The attitudes of white officers and enlisted men mattered a great deal. And like I said before, there is racism, and you have to be cautious because some researchers will just zone in on that and extrapolate it out to represent the entire Navy. Wells is a staunch abolitionist. He wants his men treated fairly across the board, no matter the color of their skin. Plus, the Navy officers, far in advance of Army officers, are the first ones to actually penetrate the rivers of the South and see what conditions are like on the plantations. Before this, it's all been hearsay, oh, I was down there, I visited, or they came up to Newport and talked about it. It's all abstract and it's far away. Now it's in Navy officers' faces, and they see what slavery is up close. These guys, to a man, pretty much become abolitionists at that point in time. There are a couple letters where, where officers write back to their wives and say, my God, I always supported the government. I can't believe we did that now. You know, This has to end. Plus, the influx of volunteer officers has a great effect. The Navy is very jealous of its rank structure. So if I'm a career Navy officer who's invested 20 years in my position, and I'm now a captain, I do not want to have six other guys be promoted to captain above me who just joined. So they, they enact a volunteer status. You can be a volunteer lieutenant, volunteer captain, volunteer whatever, with the understanding that when the war ends, you go away and I get my place again. A lot of these guys come from the merchant marine, which has always been racially mixed, because it doesn't matter in the middle of a storm what color the hand is that saves you or helps you laser lower the sail. That has an attitude, or affects the attitude of a lot of the guys on board the ships. There is individual racism, but there is no institutional bias. In 1864, this is demonstrated by a landing party down in Virginia that went ashore, about a dozen men, uh, because someone on shore was waving a white flag behind a shield of women. And this is not aberrant. This is something the Confederates did all the time. When they got onto the shore, all of a sudden, the women parted, and the rebels gunned down a number of the crew. One man who was killed was an African-American sailor, Wilson. Uh, he, he was known to be dead. Uh, the rest of the guys, badly wounded, managed to get back in their, their cutter or their rowing boat, got back to the ship. And even though some of these guys are bleeding like crazy, they're badly wounded, they said, give us more men, we want to go back and get Wilson. The captain could have just shelled the area and at least driven the rebels away. 
Instead, he put together two more boats crews that went back, fought their way under the beach, brought back Wilson's dead body, and took him back to his ship, along with his shipmates. <coughs> Integrated and equal. Remember the slide about the sergeant from the US Colored Troops and all the disparities in that. In the Navy, everybody gets the same clothing allotment. Two uniforms and one pair of shoes every year. You get the same food ration. And by the way, scurvy is 13% in the Army and 1% in the Navy. So enough scurvy jokes. There's actually better food in the Navy at this time. You get the same medical care, which is far, far better than Army care. Navy doctors, and to be fair, the Army got inundated by you know, thousands of casualties they didn't expect, and you had a lot of doctors in there that might not have been you know, the best of the best. In the Navy, you had to be a real doctor. You had to basically serve a, a term uh, as an assistant past surgeon. You had to basically write what we would call a dissertation. You had to prove you knew your stuff. Navy doctors were slowly getting towards the idea of modern medicine. Like, nobody understood germs yet, but they realized that, oh, if we open the windows, change the sheets, the guys do better. Also, when the Army is changing bandages, if this fellow has been wounded, whether he wins or loses his battle with that wound, when he's done with the bandages, the Army takes the bloody bandages, dries them, and reuses them. Guess what the Navy does in the middle? They wash them. Nobody put two and two together, but the Navy knew this worked by trial and error. Everybody gets that medical care. And this is demonstrated from 1864 Navy Hospital in New Bern. Of the 15 enlisted men, half of them are African American. They also got the same pay. Pay is something that's surprising because the Navy could have cooked the books on everybody. When payday came, you didn't actually get any hard cash. They kept a ledger. If you went on Liberty overnight or two nights or something, you got a small pittance to get a couple drinks and stuff like that, you came back to the ship. The reason the Navy does this for all sailors, they don't want to give you enough pocket money to scoot home. If you can't afford to leave town on the train or buy you know, civilian clothes, that's great, you gotta come back to the ship, they got you. They could have lied to everybody, especially African Americans who maybe were getting paid for the first time in their life if you're from the South and were ignorant of the whole process. But the Navy doesn't. Everyone gets the same pay across the board, also the same bonuses. All those black painted metal ironclads in South Carolina waters, think of the heat and humidity. You're basically in a bake oven. You had to pay guys 25% extra to volunteer to serve on those ships. White and black sailors got that across the board. Also the same prize money. Up until World War I, you got a percentage of the value of a captured ship. In the first year of the war, when the status of African Americans in the fleet, especially uh, Southern African Americans, was a little unclear, they weren't slotted to get prize money. By 1864, the whole system was retroactively changed so that everyone from the get-go got prize money. And what's nice is, a lot of that prize money, that's okay, we'll get back to prize money in a moment. Same treatment before the law, I'm one bullet off. There's another episode aboard the Pampero in 1864. Two sailors get in a fight, an Irish fellow named James Conlon and an African-American named James Dixon. And they trade insults, not the ones you probably have in your mind right now. They mostly questioned each other's legitimacy of their, their mother's marriage status, shall we say. After they finished doing that, they started trading punches. There's no advantage to one or the other. They're given and getting as good as the other guy until finally the African-American locks in a punch on the Irishman that knocks him to the deck and the fellow hits his head on the metal deck fitting, much as I did on the New Jersey. <laughs> Fortunately for me, I didn't die like Conlon did. Now, normally when I tell that story, you ask people, what do you think would happen at this point in time in America? And it usually involves a rope and a noose, period. No, the Navy examined the case, talked to eyewitnesses, says this was a sailor's fight, nothing was done wrong, no charges. Prize money, prize money not only is going to sailors, the Navy, which keeps a large chunk of the prize money and the value of these ships that they're capturing can be hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars in period money, millions and millions today. The large chunk that goes to the government doesn't disappear in somebody's pocket. They invest it and when the war is over, they basically pay everyone pensions and set up homes for soldiers and sailors that had no color line. So you could go to a home in Philadelphia, whether you were black, white, or any other race, so long as you'd been a sailor. The wartime peak, remember, it was 10% of the Army. I know that represents a great many more men, but the Navy goes to 25% African American. It grows slowly in the beginning, 2.5%, goes to 8, jumps to 15. By 64, the Mississippi Squadron, which of course is, is getting most of the escaped slaves down there in the southern Mississippi, they've jumped to a third African American. 
and yet in the paintings we see, it's rare to find a black sailor. Those ships should all have 30% African Americans. By 65, of course, there's only half a year's worth of data there. Everybody starts to get winnowed out. After the discharges, they're down to 15%, which is still six times the pre-war average of 2.5. So there's no you know, institutional Navy plan to get everyone who's non-white out of the Navy. How do they perform in combat? Everyone on a ship is in danger. I could tell you more stories of the men on board a ship going into combat taking one of the younger powder monkeys, uh, little kids responsible for running gunpowder to the guns going from the bottom of the ship up. And they will take him and say, this is going to be pretty hot and heavy. Let's tuck you down here in this particular room. We think it's safe. Damned if that's not the one place a shell comes in and kills the kid. There's no safe place on the ship. The Army is more hesitant. Grant at the crater in 1864, if you're familiar with that battle, he has specially trained African-American troops that have been prepped psychologically and physically to go into the crater and mount it with ladders and storm the rebel. When the time actually comes to do that, though, Grant is terrified that it's a bad plan and those men will be slaughtered. He's afraid of the bad press. So instead of calling off the attack, he sends in white troops who don't know what the hell they're doing because they have no training. To make it worse, he sends in the trained black troops who can't do their job because it's the crater's full of white troops being killed by the rebels. It's a bad idea. On board a ship, there's no way to keep the black sailors out of harm. You can't say, everyone who's black, go here, with, it's safe. There is no safe place. Everybody fights, and they fill every enlisted billet, including 100 deck petty officers. There are loads of petty officers on board the ship, but if you're a staff petty officer, that could be a steward, that could be the fellow in charge of the mess room, things like that. A deck petty officer has command authority over the men under him. So you have the really unusual situation of at least in 100 instances of black petty officers commanding men of mixed races. You also have seven men that earn the Medal of Honor. And I won't go through all their citations in that, but they are every bit as heroic as the white sailors, sometimes more so. There is also an additional danger, of course, if they're captured. There are countless stories of Confederates capturing or forcing ashore one of our small gunboats on a river and winnowing out the black sailors and just assassinating them on the river bank. This happens again and again. The few that are lucky enough to make it into places like Andersonville, quote unquote lucky enough, um, Wells makes certain that not only do his sailors have a fair shake, which Stanton doesn't like. Stanton wants to see only soldiers you know, sent back home. Every sailor means there's one more soldier that doesn't come back to Stanton's ranks in the army. Well, what Wells does, he tells his officers, you go, you go set up your own cartels locally. Don't tell me about it. I want you to make prisoner exchanges. And he lets the Rebs know if there's any more shooting of black sailors, he's going to start shooting captured Confederate sailors, of which there are a fair number. Also, if you're going into combat, often in the Navy, if they expected a scrape and the crew was majority black, they would staff that ship with extra Marines just to help fight off any borders. Again, Wells ordered local Navy cartels. One other side note to all this, the Navy also set up refugee camps along the coast of the South. Now, the Army did this too, but of course, the Army wants everyone, women and children, unionists, blacks, away from the front line. That makes sense. Unfortunately, you're taking a whole body of people of every race from the South who are used to humid weather and mild winters, and you're lugging them into the cold, frigid North to spend the winter. And the camps were all but concentration camps. There's no forced labor or anything, but they're stuck there because the Army doesn't know what to do with them. The Navy basically says, we have the same situation. There are thousands of men and women and children trying to join the Navy and get on Lincoln gunboats, sometimes with their chickens, which sounds funny, but that's their livelihood. Guy will join if you take my wife and kids. What do we do with them? We're not going to use Navy gunboats and take them off station and use them as taxi cabs. So what the Navy does is they begin to set up small camps along the coast, maybe 1,000 people, small enough that the Rebs don't care about them. And what's more, they teach the people or allow the people to farm the local plantations for themselves. They will pay them for whatever work they do. They also arm them and train them to use weapons, including the black slaves who've just escaped. And this is totally, totally hush-hush because the North would have flipped out about it. But Wells works on what's expedient at the time. It's a necessary thing because the Navy can't land sailors and Marines to constantly defend these little enclaves. But they exist. After the war, what happens? The reason we don't know this more about this story Arianism is a, a phrase we typically associate with uh, Adolf Hitler. The word starts over here. It's not one of our brightest episodes. The Jim Crow period comes in, of course, and there's, there's out and out memory loss. Black sailors are not winnowed out of the fleet, but their numbers begin to go down. Their contributions are totally overlooked, both in the Army and the Navy. We suddenly just develop absolute memory loss for what happened just a few years before. The Navy, to be fair, also becomes more mechanical. 
Under Jim Crow, African Americans were forbidden from learning mechanical skills. The Navy is moving from old sailing to steam to a lot more mechanical systems on board. If you're already in the Navy, like the guys on the left, great, we'll train you. But if you're joining the Navy, and I have a white sailor with mechanical skills, and a black sailor who knows the old skills of sail handling and carpentry and things like that, I'll go with the sailor that's already trained. It saves me a, a whole bunch of effort. So sailors start to drop in numbers in the Navy. The black midshipmen who are brave enough to start a Naval Academy, racism hounds them out of that. So there are no 19th century Naval officers who are African American. The numbers drop, 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 all the way down to beginning of World War II, when there's half a percentage of blacks. The Navy and the country have also found out that Filipinos are shorter and appear to be more docile, so they will be more subservient than blacks. That's not my opinion, that, that's a quote. The needs of World War II changed everything. Once again, the country needs more men, and African Americans, much to their credit, flock to the colors. By the end of the war, Wesley Brown is accepted into the academy in Annapolis, and four years later becomes the first black sailor to graduate, black officer from Annapolis. The first black admiral, Gravely, uh, attains that rank in 1964. Since then, there have been 49 African American admirals, 15 of whom I think are still on the active list. Now, why don't we know this story any better? For one, it's part of the overall unknown Navy story. See the crazed man in the back row with the cutlass? This is from the town where I live in North Attleboro. He wants to make sure the Navy's represented in this little GAR picture. But what's significant is there's one sailor and 26 soldiers. That ratio is spot on. So whose history do you think we know more of? The 26 soldiers, not the one sailor. Plus these guys, when they retire, chances are they're all from the company that joined the 7th Massachusetts. They can reinforce each other's opinions, they can compare notes, they can tell a, a cohesive, holistic story about every battle they're in. That sailor, because he's part of a federal institution and went away to Boston to join, if there's another sailor in town, the chances of him being on the same fleet or even the same squadron are pretty slim. So the Navy story is already hard to, to ferret out. Beyond that, and we're getting into the, the, the section here where visuals matter. Of all the Navy statues, of which again, there are far fewer than Army ones, I could only find two that even represent an African American in the fleet among his white compatriots. And yet, there should be 30% or at least 25% of each one of these statuaries with African Americans in them. I'll tell you how deep this, this runs and how susceptible we are to it. I was looking for images of black sailors that I didn't already have to illustrate this talk, and I ran across this one. It goes back to the War of 1812. It's Perry's famous moment when he says, don't give up the ship. His ship, the Lawrence, is it suffered 80% casualties. It's all but sinking. He literally tells his men, don't give up the ship. I get to go to the Niagara and you know try and save the day, which he does. He gets the entire British squadron to surrender. The painting right out of the get-go is a little, little odd. They got the number of sailors right. We have documentation that says four sailors escorted Perry. Well, the little kid up front is his nephew, Alexander. There's no proof Alexander went with him at all or was even on board the ship. But by God, it just tugs at the nation's heartstrings. See this little 13-year-old child trying to pull down his foolhardy uncle as he crosses him on the shot and shell. So a few inaccuracies there. You'll see how many more there are in a moment. I'll remind you that 50% of his crew is African American. The chances of him picking four white sailors are pretty slim. By 1815, towards the end of the war, the crew has gotten bigger, and there's still no African American sailors, but at least Alexander's gone. All right, so we're, we're, we're clawing our way towards accuracy. 1865, William Powell is tasked to paint a naval victory for, I believe it's a state house in Ohio, and he chooses Perry's victory at the time. Again, Alexander is back because emotion runs high. He does have a few African Americans there, which is good, not 50%. The crew's bigger than it should be, but you've got three African Americans, one actually in the crew, two who are wounded, but they're there anyway. In 1865, Powell is asked by the United States Senate to replicate that painting for the Senate chambers in Washington, D.C., and he does. Now, if you read the Senate write-up about this, they did not do their homework. They can't explain the one African-American in there, they're ignoring the two other guys, and they said, well, you know, emancipation had just happened. So we think they put the one black sail in there just as a stop to emancipation, because, well, now that blacks were free, we had to put one in there. There's actually one black missing, another white sailor added, the fellow in the water is still there asking for help, and the one fellow in the back that has obviously, or the Senate described as Hannibal, his servant. He didn't have a servant named Hannibal. By 1911, at the height of Jim Crow, we're back to an all-white crew. Alexander, at least, is gone. We've lost any African-American in the, in the small dinghy. 
This is the image we're used to now, the uh, forever stamp that came out in 2013. You'll notice that by cutting the edges of the picture, we're down to a single black sailor. So this is the image that we see and assume it's accurate. This is what actually seems to have happened. Marto Schweig worked for the WPA doing a lot of, I wouldn't say folk paintings, but that sort of describes it. And she hit the history books, looked up the records. Perry is accompanied by four loyal sailors and Cyrus Tiffany, old Cyrus. Cyrus Tiffany grew up with him in Taunton, Massachusetts, near where I live. He is not his servant. He was never a slave. He's born in 1738 and served in the Revolutionary War. The guy's already over 70 years old at this time. At the height of the battle, when the Niagara is being, or the Lawrence is being beaten to death, Perry actually realizes, I don't want Cyrus to get killed. Give him a musket, stick him in a gangway, make sure that no sailor deserts down there faking a wound or anything. And he does that. Whenever he realizes Perry is going over the side to change ships, Cyrus Tiffany goes with him. And he's not trying to haul him down. Records say he's trying to protect him with his own body. And again, Alexander at least has been replaced accurately by Cyrus. And this is either Jesse or Newport who are also on the crew. This is probably the most accurate painting and should have been our stamp because what you see influences what you believe, especially when it's inaccurate. In Lynn, Massachusetts, again, north of Boston in 2016, the gravity of this situation came home to me. I was asked to give a talk on African Americans in the Union Navy. I was in an enlisted uniform and all that, you know, because it helps the kids understand. Lynn is a totally, totally racially mixed school. You name a race, they're in Lynn. And I'm standing up at the front, a whole gaggle of kids around me, and they're interested. One kid gets especially interested when I throw up an image of a black sailor. And he interrupts me and says, there were people like me. This kid had never been taught that the fleet was anything but all white. I told him, yes, there were. I, don't, I hope I never have to answer that question again. 